Hello, how are we doing? Thank you for joining us at the grand opening of Imagine Batavia. My name is Anthony Laverde. I have the pleasure of serving as the CEO and I really appreciate all of you coming tonight. And uh, I know you're not here to see me as much as I wish that was the case. So I'm just gonna get to the point. I'd like to introduce everyone to Dave Jude Courtney. Hey guys, how are you? <laughs> All right, so we have a couple of special little things to address before. Um, our grand opening uh, was in, I think they're up there, it benefited Batavia United Way. And it's a really important um, core value of Imagine to be a part of community and benefit others. So James was kind enough to bring a mask that he assigned um, and he will take a photo with you as well, and we're gonna auction that off after our little discussion. So make sure you have your Venmo and your credit cards ready. <laughs> so, and we're also, we're going to pass around a mic in a little while. We'll allow everyone to ask some questions, and hopefully um, I keep everyone on point. Not like last night, I went a little over. So, thanks for being here. Oh, such a pleasure, such a um, pleasure. And um, thank you guys for, for coming in. Dude, does that this to be, I mean, does that this theater rock? I mean, how comfortable are these chairs? Well, I thought I knew everything about you. We're gonna get right to the point. <laughs> I read something the other day that fascinated me. Okay. And I read that your cat played a role in how you, your mannerisms in being Michael Myers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I moved into a place in Los Angeles and, uh, um, and there was a cat, uh, his name was Parsifal. He was 12 years old because all the neighbors knew he'd been around for 12 years. You didn't see a cat for half a block, which meant he was a bad sass cat for half a block. Right? <laughs> and um, within a month, he was hanging out with me. Within a couple of months, you know, two, three months, he was sleeping with me at night. You know, he'd sit on the couch next to me. We were, we were good buds. Um, but when he'd want to wake up and go outside, um, he'd go out and hunt, and, and I'd watch him. And, um, and he was just so stealth and so fast and so smooth. And one day he was sitting, you know, up on the porch. It was stairs, you know, two tiers of stairs, up. and we're just sitting out, hanging out, enjoying the, you know, a nice afternoon, or late, you know, towards dusk actually. And um, all of a sudden he perks up and looks down the driveway, and I see four, four big raccoons walking up. I go, oh god! He hauls ass down, boom, boom. <laughs> And it was right after him. They saw him, their eyes get big, they turn around, they haul ass away around the corner. I'm thinking, oh God, this is a dead pill. You know, this is gonna cost me a couple thousand bucks. <laughs> well, a moment later, he comes back around, the biggest one's just flying. He's swiping at his butt, just swiping. He's going after him. And they go behind the house, and I'm thinking, oh, geez, man, this is good. And a little bit later, he comes up, circles around, just starts purring. He's like, yeah, dog. I'm a badass in this neighborhood. <laughs> so when when uh, when I was cast as Michael Myers, um, David Gordon Green, the director, called me and uh, said, uh, "So Jimmy, um, uh, so I, I really want you to move like a cat." I was like, "That's kind of interesting." Uh, uh, Parsifal, my cat, sitting in my lap right now. He goes, "Okay, we're good." All right. So, uh, anyways, uh, we're going to start shooting. And uh, I mean, that was it. And that's the only direction David ever gave me as well. I mean. Yeah, Parsifal was a badass, and and he lived at 23. He passed away at 23, and um, it was heartbreaking. But the dude lived a full life. He waited until I was done shooting the third movie. He was my spiritual buddy through this thing. And in fact, um, he was getting sick and and, and really very infirm um, during the shooting of Halloween Ends. And we had, were shooting in Savannah, but every week Sarah would have to bring him back to Columbia, South Carolina, where we're living at the moment. Um, to the vet, and you know, for treatment, and um, the day that Jamie and I did the the final scene, the finale. In other words, the day that I die, all of a sudden, Parsifal became Parkour Kitty. He was off the walls, jumping off stuff, climbing up things. He became he had this burst of energy the day that I died, and then 
then shortly after that, he chose to leave. So, um, yeah, he was he was an integral part, and and he is that he deserves credit. It should be like the shape: James Duke Courtney, Nick Castle, and Parsifal. <laughs> That's amazing. I I've, I've never heard that. I've known you a while. It's amazing. So you talked about the final scene. Is that the most powerful scene you've done, or are there others within Halloween that that mean a lot to you? No, that uh, hands down. Hands down, and Jamie and I both agreed. Um, after we shot that, it's she, and for me to say that it's the most powerful thing I've ever done, um, and the highlight of my career that scene. But for Jamie to say that was such an insane compliment. Um, you know, we're bruised from shoulder to halfway down our calves, both of us. Um, but but more than that, the the spiritual, the, the aspect of a love affair. I mean, we this was a love affair between us, between our characters. And for those of you who know anything about acting, it's not pretending. If, if you know, have people come up to me and say, "I'd make a good actor. I can lie." Well, um, no, you make a <laughs> actor <laughs> because it, James Cagney said, "In order to be a good actor, you need to be able to stand on two feet and tell the truth. You have to believe with every fiber of your being that what you're doing is real." And <clears throat> at one point, um, I'm laying on the table. Um, and they're putting, you know, special effects prosthetics on me, and Chris Nelson is wiring in the blood, and they're resetting lights, and um, <clears throat> Jamie, I'm laying there, I couldn't move. Jamie stood next to me and held my hand for an hour. She closed her eyes, and we just held hands and, and just shared the love, because when we were experiencing that scene, we went through the emotions of wanting to kill each other, wanting to die, wanting to live. Well, I mean, you know, the love, the hate, the fear, all these emotions were very raw and real in us. So, um, yeah, hands down, man, most powerful thing I've ever done. When you brought up Jamie, I would be remiss. Now Oscar Wayne, how is she? She is the poster child for an empowered woman. I, I, I consider it such an honor and a privilege to, and to work with her. In our business, um, the highest compliment you can pay somebody is, you're a pro, or she's a pro and Jamie is a pro. That woman is 100% prepared. She's kind, she's funny, she's self-deprecating. She's been sober for 20 some odd years now. And so, you know, shooting Halloween 2018, where we're dealing with issues of addiction, um, uh, psychological trauma, mental illness, family pathologies, um, these were all real in her life. So she was really reliving these things in Halloween 2018. And then, there, of course, we're dealing with female empowerment. You know, the, this woman taking back her power from the shape, from whatever it is, her trauma. And this is all metaphoric. Think about it. You know, um, she's done so much incredible work. And um, I, again, I, I, I would wish for every one of you, on a human level, on a personal level, not as a star, but I would love for e or wish for each one of you that you could actually meet Jamie Lee Curtis because. To me, the dynamic human being like that is, is truly a gift. I agree. Um, she's a huge supporter of theatrical, and, and she's been a friend of ours, and, and we're big fans. Um, I recently read that there was a very short checklist to get your role. Could you enlighten the audience on what that was? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I moved back to Columbia, South Carolina from Los Angeles because I got to the place in my career where I was happy to work in front of a camera, but I wasn't going to work for it. Um, I had done a bunch of stuff in my life. Um, I wanted to focus on writing and producing, and um, so I decided to be back close to my family because my nephews are all state and national champion athletes, and, and I've missed lots and lots of wrestling matches and soccer matches and rugby you know, matches. And, um, and so, uh, you know, I moved back there, bought a little place, just, you know, gutted it, you know, rebuilt it, you know, remodeled it. Um, and then just, just focused on writing. And I get a call from uh, the stunt coordinator who stunt coordinated the, uh, the two Rob Zombie films. And I've known him for 30 years. I've never worked for him as a stuntman. I was always an actor on the things that he did, but we knew each other. More importantly, we had a mutual best friend, Chris Nelson and Jennifer, Je Chris and Jennifer Nielsen. Chris is a stuntman, Jennifer is, is a wine connoisseur. And, and, um, and so, um, Ron Hutchinson read the script and he called Malik Akkad and David Gordon Green and said, um, this script is different than any other script that has been done in the Halloween you know, franchise. 
whoever you have playing Michael Myers needs to have really deep acting chops and has to be a really good stuntman. And there are not many of those around. I mean, I studied with Stella Adler, who was, was um, Marlon Brando's coach. I had a private coach from the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. I worked hard at acting. And folks, it's hard, it's difficult. Working, I mean, getting down to the place where you have technique as an actor is not an easy thing to do. It's, it's far easier to train as a champion athlete than it is to train as a champion actor, I can promise you. Um, so David Gordon Green says, okay, well, that's cool. So he has to be six foot three, 200 pounds, and he's gotta be in his 60s, who do you know? And, and, and so, and it was actually Chris, Chris and Jennifer Nielsen who reminded Ron of me, they're like Jimmy Courtney. And so when they brought me in, um, they, oddly enough, were shooting in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, that's where Danny McBride and David Gordon Green had their company. Um, so, uh, you know, Ron said, Are you interested? I said, yeah, of course. You know, so I went down and um, they put me on tape and, you know, they had me move, talk about my experience, talk about, you know, the perception of the character. Um, went out and got my little pickup truck and, and, you know, if you live in the South, you gotta have a pickup truck. And, and I didn't even get out of the parking lot and I got a call from Blumhouse in California. And they were like, are you available on such and such a dates? Which, by the way, if you're an actor, is the kiss of death. It's the kiss of death. Because that means they get you all excited. And so I don't get excited about these things anymore. Um, I, I let that go decades ago. Um, and I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm available. So I, I get to the road, two miles away is the freeway. Didn't even get to the freeway. I, they call me back and they said, David Gordon Reed wants to meet you. Can you come back? And, um, and that was it. Once they saw me, they stopped. Everything stopped. It's terrific. So I know we have a ton of fans that have much better questions than me, I'm sure. So we're going to ask one more, and then Sean over there has the mic. So if you were giving a piece of advice, and we just talked earlier about how many no's you hear in your life, and it takes one yes to change your life. What would you give an actor coming up that might hear so many no's and get discouraged, but probably shouldn't? Well, I think this is an axiom for life, because we talk about business, right? Um, it's it's a, about... So if I were talking to an actor, it's like this, talent matters. Like, we have to be honest about where our talent lies. You know, you might want to be a pipe fitter, but you got, you got two left feet and, only, and two hands full of thumbs. You're not going to be able to do it. You know, welding is an art. Practicing law is an art. You know, it's a, I mean, uh, whatever it is in life we do, we have to be honest about our talent. Hard work matters even more because hard work can even trump talent. If we work hard enough, we can get good at something. But at the end of the day, persistence is omnipotent. Persistence is what gets you there. And as I look in the rear view mirror of my life, the, the, the highway is littered with bodies of people who quit too soon. People who might have been more talented than myself. People who maybe even worked harder than myself. And that's saying something. But they quit. And I remember there was a guy who came out from uh, Belgium, when Jean-Claude Van Damme was a big star. And he too was a European kickboxing champion. And he's like, I've been to be myself three years. And I was like, dude, buy a ticket home. Go home, man. You're, you know, three years, really? Dude, you've got to commit. You've got to commit to whatever it is you do, you've got to commit with no end in sight. Otherwise, you know, you're just another schlep. I mean, you're just another guy who's going to, like, you know, schlep through life and, and, you know, which is not a bad thing. I mean, we all have our focus, we all have, but if you want to succeed, so I, you know, and, 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 and um, Anthony and I were just talking about this earlier, I'm impervious to no's. Because, you know, going through the thing of, of financing a film, we're going to get 100 no's. I've gotten so many no's. I bet you the no's in my career have been in the thousands, way into the thousands. I don't care about the no's because those yeses are what got me here. So I don't know if we want to touch on that. Thank you. So you just talked about financing films. And that's how you and I have gotten to know each other really well. Should I discuss the film you're working on now? Yeah, so I'm doing a, a, a film right now. It's a coming of age story of a high school soccer player. And um, it's, uh, I, it's very relevant because it deals with addiction, it deals with bullying, it deals with um, depression, uh, it deals with a lot of the issues that we have dealt with. I mean, I was bullied as a kid, that's why I started martial arts. Um, and it is, it goes back to the story of, look man, don't, don't wait for somebody else to give you permission to do what you want to do. Do it, do it, and do it, and do it, and do it. And so, you know, I've been, um, by the time, it, 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 everything's coming together, now we have a WGA strike and the Screen Actors are going to strike, so I can't tell you I'm making it this fall like I'm supposed to, but 
If I made it this fall, it will have taken me close to 15 years to get this film made. And I heard a lot of no's, man. I heard a lot of no's. I reached out to thousands of banks and investors and hedge funds. And before 2008, I got close. I got a huge bank that finances films. And they were like, don't worry about it. The other banks are failing, but we're not. I kept in touch with this guy. All of a sudden, I get an email that says, so sorry. Um, the bank is pulling back on financing films, and by the way, I'm cleaning out my desk. Now, if I had given up at that moment, I would not be making this film right now. But I am, and one day, it's gonna be playing on this theater, and you guys are gonna sit watching it. Yeah. Awesome. So, if you just raise your hand, Sean will walk around. We'll do our best to get to everyone um, right here first, and uh, we'll, we'll get to everyone. Hi, Mr. Curtin, how are you? Going well. <laughs> um, uh, I'm a, I've been a professional actor in New York and Chicago for the past 20 years, and it's very nice to hear the horror genre taking the time to recognize it takes more than just a lumbering stuntman like in the 50s to create a film. You, Tony Todd, Robert England, uh, you know, icons that are doing what it needs to do to make something more than just a man in a rubber mask. Um, I, first of all, I want to say we re I appreciate that. And you mentioned talk, uh, you mentioned that you uh, worked with Stella Adler, and I was curious: was there what, what was one of the biggest things that you took from her um, to go into the, your acting uh, career that stuck with you? That um, if you don't want to share, you don't have to. But I was just curious if there was what was the number one thing that you took from her that you still that still rings true to today. Well, uh, Stella and my, uh, the private coach from the Royal Academy, um, Ron Ray, uh, taught me one of the things I took from both of them that's very important is, um, you know, if you have talent at something and you're inspired, dude, you can light up a room, you can light up a, a set, you can light up a stage. It's the days that you're not inspired. Your dog died three days ago, you got a hangover. I mean, you know, you, you're, you're, you're pissed off at your wife or your husband or your lover or your friend. I mean, it's when you're not inspired that technique matters. And that's why we grind. That's why we work. That's why we study and we grind and grind and grind and grind because those moments are going to come. And the audience doesn't deserve to put up with your, your pain. What they deserve is your best. And so, you know, working hard on the techniques that make us good at what we do, and that's everything, it's not just acting, it's music, it's everything we do in every business. I mean, and one of the things I love about Anthony and his, his crew here at Imagine is <clears throat> their attention to detail. It's the, it's the nuances that these guys are paying attention to, which is what I have to do and you have to do and everybody else in this room, if you want to be super successful at something, we have to pay attention to detail. And that takes work. It takes focus. It takes, it takes hearing things we don't want to hear. It takes working when you don't feel like working. It ta you know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's really... Um, and, and I would say listening to and focusing on perspectives other than them, what we think is true and real because the universe is much, much larger than our minds. Thank you. Next question. Uh, Sean, you can come down here and then we'll get you up there. I was just wondering, um, how was the day when you filmed your death scene? I can imagine that was a really emotional day. What was that like to film? Again, it's, it's the most powerful thing I've ever done um, as an actor and in a film. Uh, you, you know, when, when you're working like that, you don't think about things. I mean, I don't think I'm, I'm in it, you know what I mean? So um, knowing that I was going to be in that place, it was really beautiful because Christopher Nelson the Academy Award winning special effects makeup artist who created my mask and all the prosthetics. Um, he's a musician. Uh, I am too, only, only I'm a hack compared to him. Um, but we have very similar tastes, especially um, David Bowie. David Bowie is my number one influence as an artist, hands down, hands down. And it's also his number one influence. So every day before work, um, whether it's six in the morning or six at night, he would choose the soundtrack that he would play while I was in makeup, and it would be relevant to whatever we were going to shoot. And I had put off listening to David Bowie's last, last album because I was, I was moved and, and, and very much in pain in a very silent way about David Bowie's passing. Um, and I, just, I was just resisting listening to that. So that is the album that, that Chris Nelson played 
the first day that we sh and the most important day that we shot the the you know the um, no I'm, I'm sorry it wasn't the first day because we did a lot of the lead ups the you know the fighting lead ups and stuff but the day the big day of the finale Chris played that and that took me right into the emotional place that I needed to be in and and um, and when 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 we began shooting that death that death scene um, right before we shot any of it I called Jamie over we went off to the side and we started talking about beat by beat what we were going to do and and we both had tears just streaming down our eyes um, so I, all I have to say is I lived it All right, next question. We'll get Sean to get two up there, thanks. I feel like I'm at Jerry Springer, kind of, so. But anyway. Uh, it's not your kid, Sean. Yeah. <laughs> James, Jude, not mine either. James, Jude, Courtney, J JJC, you the man. Um, I was going to ask about your how you got your mannerisms and you talked about your cat, so that was very cool. Um, when you mentioned uh, Danny McBride, so he's uh, you know obviously in the comedy genre. How was it working with him? And like, did he give you like, did he try to do anything like comical at all or anything, or was it straightforward like? Scary well, I'm going to answer both your, both your questions, man, because the, the parts of the cat was only part of it. So I'll answer that as well, but. Uh, because Danny McBride, um, <clears throat> Danny McBride is clearly a very funny man, but unlike most comedians, he does not need to be the funniest man in the room. Danny McBride listens, which is an art form. If you know we pay attention in the world, most people don't listen. Um, most people want to express and talk, but more, very few people really listen. Danny McBride is the best audience you'll ever meet because he listens so clearly and finds humor in so many things. And then when he chooses to speak, it's funny as hell. Um, we never talked about the um, the character or the story. Um, he, when I met him, I complimented him on the nuance of what he had created in terms of you know the comedy, comedy leading into you know all the, the you know to leading up to the violence, leading up to the scare, leading up to you know we had a little talk about the you know the rhythms of what he created, but basically. We're just a bunch of guys hanging out talking in between sets. You know, I mean, he's, he's just a, he's a regular guy. Um, as far as the character goes and the movement of the character, um, there's a great old character actor named Ted Knight. And I was waiting on tables, in the, you know, right when I showed up in the early 80s. I was a tour guide at Universal Studios. Um, I waited on tables for a few years, and then I was cast in the live show of The Adventures of Conan at Universal Studios, where I fought with double swords and did a high fall in the movie, 20 foot high fall in the flaming pit, it was so much fun. But when I met, um, when I met uh, uh, Ted Knight, he was, you know, like 65 years old with this totally smoking, like young date, and he's sitting at a table and he somehow recognized I was an actor, and um, he said, I'm gonna give you a gift. I was like, well, that's sad. And he goes, if you wanna be a good actor, learn to emulate. Um, like, the, the guy walking in front of you on the street, the bartender, your mother, your friend. But don't try to move your hands the way they move their hands. Don't try to capture, don't try to imitate their voice. Reach inside their soul, and if you can grab their soul, you will naturally move your body the way they move their body. You will naturally speak the way they speak. So when I got the call to go down to Charleston to be put on tape, I watched the 1978 version one time, and there's a certain scene where Nick Castle as the shape is walking camera left to camera right. And in my head I went, I got it. And I never thought about it again. I never thought about how to move, how to be the shape. So what I did was I allowed spiritually for what Nick Castle so, in, so incredibly creatively, you know, and beautifully created. Um, and I allowed that into my body. And this body that I live in has decades of martial arts training. It has done shamanic work with South American shaman and African shaman and North American First Nation shaman. 15 years of volunteering for family constellation therapy, helping people, victims of trauma, primarily women. Um, so all the, you know, all the studying I've done, all the, all the work I've done, all the killers I've played, 
you know, all the violent things that have happened to me in my life, in my real life, I've had guns to my head. I've, I've known violence in my life and, and somehow managed to get out on top of that. <clears throat> so the, so, the, the, so, the, so the, the, the compendium of everything that I've been and am with Nick Castle's creation inside me driving me, that was the driving force. And I naturally moved the way I would move, which is what David Gordon Green wanted. He wanted what would happen to the shape 40 years after. And, and so that's the way that rolled. You're the, you're the coolest dude ever, dude. No, I'm telling my mom that. I mean, Thank you. Oh, not me. Oh, hey. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I thought that was for me. Go ahead. We, I think we have time for one or two. I'm already over again. I did it again. Go ahead. Hi, Mr. Gordon. Um, question about, oh, you're my favorite, Mr. Michael Myers, first off. Um, and I, I noticed you do it in three different ways in your three movies. With, 2018, it was the rebirth of Michael Myers. Kills was an angry Michael Myers, and Ends was a weakened Michael Myers. So, how did you go about the role differently, and what were things you wanted to maintain in each movie? Well, it's organic. Um, if you, when you, and every actor works differently. You know, um, I I found out not too long ago that Tom Hanks that works the same way I work. Um, there are some people who will sit down and make copious notes. Uh, about motivation, and they'll make notes on every scene. If it's dialogue, they make notes on the dialogue. They have lists of you know various you know components of, of the character. What I do is I will drive or ride my motorcycle, or when I'm working out, or when I'm you know um, you know hiking, um, I will just roll it through my my mind and my heart, and I just allow things to to sort of bubble up. So the the difference in those three iterations, the, the progression of those uh, iterations were completely organic. Now, some of the things that um, I chose to do organically um, in ends, David Gordon Green and I talked about because at that point, there are choices that he may or may not see you know, very much. And, and although David didn't direct me um, in terms of the character, uh, there are often times where he, you know, see, I stay in character until I hear check the gate, um, or unless I needed to, to break a little bit to have to talk about direction. And so sometimes, uh, you know, he called me shape. Uh, so David would go, shape, 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 come here. And we'd look at the monitor and, and we'd go, so what do you think of this or what of that? So we'd have a little dialogue. One time we were trying to figure out a particular scene, which I won't tell you which one it is. Um, and he said, and he had one idea, and I, I had another idea. So we were about to, we we're, were getting, we we're setting up for my idea. And he said, okay, Shay, it was your idea, take it. So he let me direct the scene. And that threw me. But that speaks to David Gordon Green. Because David Gordon Green checks his ego at the door. He creates a fertile environment, a sandbox. And if you're in that box, he lets you do what he wants you to do by the virtue of you fully creating by virtue of his inspiration. So, and, and he just sort of guides that, that journey. Um, but all of it's organic, you know, all of it is organic. And I happen to be working with a man who elicits and solicits creativity from anywhere and everywhere. That's, that's why I say his ego is not even there. So what I did was organic and David Gordon Green's direction is organic and the script was organic. And, and let me say this about Halloween Ends. Um, you know, some people, wanted to see more of the shape. Some people have you know, various opinions about this. Making a movie, much like probably any business, um, certainly this team is amazing, um, the, you, making a film is like playing on a football team. First and foremost, you have to buy into the coach's program. If you've got any chance of winning, let alone winning a championship, you've got to buy into the coach's program. And if you can't buy into the coach's program, get out of the locker room and find another team, man. Because you know, this is about being our best, and the, that director or that CEO or whatever is there for a reason. So, I I feel like I mean, as a as a as a football player, did I want to play every snap? Heck yeah. As as an actor, do I want to be in every scene? Heck yeah. But I'm there to fulfill the vision of my coach, of my director, and I'm really proud of the work we did, and I'm really proud of the people I worked with, and I'm eternally grateful for having worked with all. Of them. We'll try to get one, all right, oh boy. All right, one more there. I'm gonna get in trouble again. Right there, Sean. 
Tom, do we have a film after this? <laughs> Hi, Mr. James U. Corny. I just want to say it's an honor and a privilege to uh, meet you. It's my first time meeting a horror character and an actor, so my hat's off to you. I've seen all three of the Halloween films. At first, I was scared to watch them, but now they are fantastic. Now, my question is, um, working with Jamie and Nick Castle and David Gordon Green and all the characters and all the crew members, when you first got the role as Michael in 2018 to Halloween Ends, was there anything different based on like, the persona of the character that you wanted to improve or like something that just clicked right away and you just wanted it to stay that way with the character? No, once I, once I saw the 78 version and said in my own mind I got it, I never thought about it again. Never once did I think about it. It was, there's, it's, I have not intellectualized this character even now. And I, and I probably never will. Maybe I will 10 years from now. I don't know. Uh, uh, Nick Castle came in about the, in the middle of shooting 2018, where he did that one scene in the, in the window, and we both inhabited that scene. We have never talked about the character, ever. We're very, very good friends. We hang out a lot. We, you know, we, we hang out um, an off time. We travel together. We often eat dinner together. We talk on the phone a lot. We have never talked about the character. So whatever germinated in that moment, in you know, watching the 1978, is what organically grew from all those things I just talked about. Um, I, I never talked about the character with, well, Jamie talked to, the, about, to me about the character, but I never talked to her about the character. So she gave her impression of pure evil and all these other kind of things. For me, um, this character, because I'm living it, is not pure evil. It's a, it's not a 3D, third dimension, you know, character that lives in, uh, you know, the the black and white, right and wrong, good and bad, you know, hot and cold world. This is a 5D character, a, fi a, fifth, a fifth dimension character that just is. And you know, you don't judge a cat for killing a mouse. Why the f would you judge me for killing a mouse? <laughs> On that note. Uh... <laughs> All right, we'll get one more question from the back, up there, Sean, and then, I'm sorry, I'm, my staff will fire me. Anthony lives in mortal fear. <laughs> of my staff. Of his staff. <laughs> Are you? Oh, there he goes, hello. Hey, man, how you doing? Doing quite well. I just want to say I'm not only here, you know, amongst these fans, I'm also here for my dad who just passed away a few weeks ago from addiction and hearing your words on the movie about addiction with, this, uh, with the high school soccer team, was it? Yeah, brother, yeah. I'm sorry to hear that. In, in, uh, yeah, and man, I just wanna say it's so cool meeting you because he was such a huge Halloween fan, like, oh my gosh, I'm already feeling it. But to ask the question, um, what was the moment you realized you wanted to become an actor? Uh, in fourth grade, I had several epiphanies uh, and one of them was I was going to make movies for a living, and I never had posters up in my room. I, I didn't. Um, I do have a, a spirit guide. I consider uh, Basil Rathbone, who has played lots and lots of evil characters. Um, also played Sherlock Holmes. Uh, he was in Son of Frankenstein. Um, but I knew I was going to make movies. So in fifth grade, I picked up my dad's 1950s era, you know, Kodak Trilens eight millimeter camera and started making my own movies. Uh, it was a history project, or, you know, I went to a Catholic school, so it was a religion project or an English project. My dad shot, I have six younger brothers, he shot every football game we played, every basketball game we played, martial arts, birthdays, Easter, Christmas, he shot everything. And so I, I knew I was going to make films. Um, and, you know, part of it, it, I mean, to me, being an actor is being a part is being a filmmaker. Being a stuntman is a, being a filmmaker. Writer, producer, director, um, everything that we do is a part of filmmaking. So I, I actually consider myself more than an actor. I consider myself a filmmaker. Um, and then you know now I'm, uh, one of my scripts is going to be made into a film. So then I become in this particular film, I'm the writer, producer, second the director, and actor. And so. That's just a part. That's just, just a toolbox filled with things that we learn to do. And, and making movies is a really fascinating thing. There are very few businesses where you can hire 130 people and you don't have to educate anybody. 
Everybody who shows up on day one knows exactly what they're there for, and they know how to do it. And my mom saw us shoot uh, Halloween 2018. She's never seen me work before. And so she's sitting there. Uh, Jamie and I were doing a fight scene that actually we didn't put in the film. Um, but my mom said, I never realized why films cost so much money until I saw 130 people working on a film and how amazed she was to hear, you know, roll tape and everybody froze in place. And then you hear action and then you hear cut. And as soon as you hear cut, boom, 130 people are moving again, doing what they do. Um, it, it, I was lucky because I had that epiphany young. Sometimes people don't know what they really want to do until they're, they get to high school. Some don't know until after high school, college, or they don't go to college. Some don't know until they're, they've had a career for 20 years and they go, you know, I really don't like this anymore. I want to do something else. Um, I was lucky in that. Um, what I was prepared for was how hard it was, how much work it took. Um, luckily, I was raised with a work ethic and um, uh, my father and my mother imbued me and my brothers, myself and my brothers, with a work ethic. And, um, and I think the important part of that is the, the desire. Um, and Anthony and I have talked a lot about this. Um, it, it, and this is one of the reasons why I really love Imagine and what Anthony and, and, and this whole crew is doing. They're committed to community. They're committed to doing charity works because really at the end of the day, what we do is important you know, to ourselves, for our personal integrity, that we do it to the best of our ability. But we also have, we have an onus upon us to reach out to our brothers and sisters, to be here for each other, to help each other through things. And in that light, I see what I do as a healing ministry. Because you know, I've talked to EMTs and firefighters and, and, and police officers and, and, and military guys. You know, I live in Columbia, South Carolina. It's a huge military state. I've talked to a bunch of guys, especially in infantry, who've been in, 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 in firefights, blood and gore and body parts flying everywhere. And they'll go back and they'll watch these movies to chill out. So if we can bring healing in whatever we do, if we can bring love to, to our community, to the people around us, that's when we've done our job. Thank you so much, Mr. Courtney. Thank you. What is, what is your name? James Morris. James, pleasure to meet you. Thank you for being here. Nice to meet you too. All right, let's auction off that mask. Right, let's do it, All man. Right. All right, guys. I'm gonna go get it. Polish up those credit cards. Yeah. It's going, it's, hey, look guys, and it's really cool is the United Way, it, with the, what's going on here is they, it, you know, this doesn't go into some huge fund. With this particular auction, whatever we do is going to go to a very, it's going to go to a micro charity that's going to be affected in your community. Like, so this is about your community. Um, Want to hold it? Yeah. All right. It's signed. Hands we'll devil, take a photo with you as well. Um, who wants to start? I think we'll start at 500 bucks. Oh, scared you. 500 back there. You got a yellow number. I could say 10,000, you're in. <laughs> no, you stuck your hand up. What, what do you want to say? I, I think he's, he's retracting. He's, he's retracting, all right. 500. 500 to you, okay. Anybody else? Six. 600. Seven. 700. Anybody else? 800. Okay. 800. 800. I'll make you a deal. If you keep bidding, I'm gonna send one. What was your name again, James? I'm gonna send another one to James. James gets a free one. And out of his father. Anybody else wanna keep bidding? No? All right. 850. 850. 850. Come on. 900. Hey, one for 4,400 last night, just so you know. All right, 900 sold to you. So Thank you. For 900 dollars. James, thank you. Absolutely. Appreciate it. If you would come up here. Yeah. Guys, enjoy the Imagine. What these guys are doing here, I am is so stoked. The, the biggest screen is 94 freaking feet. The experience here is going to be amazing. I, I, you guys are so lucky to have this because lots of places in this country don't have this available to them. So enjoy these theaters, man. Thank you all for being here. Enjoy the film. Enjoy our facilities. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you.